Hey everybody, welcome back to the Adams County Historical Society's Caught in the Crossfire series. Right now we're standing in a really incredible place here in Gettysburg. We're actually in the cupola of the Lutheran Seminary Chapel. And it was built in 1942, so it's not a Civil War building, uh, but we're on Seminary Ridge just west of Gettysburg. And uh, this cupola is actually higher up than the more famous cupola right next door uh, of Old Dorm or Schmucker Hall which was built in 1832 to house the Gettysburg Lutheran Theological Seminary. Old Dorm was also home to the Adams County Historical Society for about 50 years. And here we have one of the best views, I think, of the first day's battlefield. Because this series is focused on the families, I want to talk about just a few sites west of town where local residents were seeking shelter and witnessing some of the battle up close on the morning and afternoon of July 1st, 1863. One thing I love about this view is the clarity that we see in the South Mountain Range, which is about eight miles away. It was this feature that allowed Lee's army to screen its movements north in the weeks leading up to the battle. And it was also a shield, of course, for the people of Adams County, who until late June believed that they might avoid a Confederate invasion. Between here and South Mountain are a series of ridges and valleys, some of them pretty well known, some of them not so much. Closest to us is McPherson's Ridge, probably best known, and it was owned by Congressman Edward McPherson at the time of the battle. Beyond that is Hur's Ridge, named for Frederick Hur, who operated a tavern along the Chambersburg Pike for many years before the Civil War. And while we're on the topic of roads, we're looking at what is now Route 30 West, or the Lincoln Highway, and uh, at the time it was called the Chambersburg Pike. And then to the left, if we pan over, we'll see the, the Fairfield Road, which is now called Route 116. Along the Chambersburg Pike, there were two streams, uh, Marsh Creek, which is about two and a half miles away, and Willoughby's Run, which is just under a mile from where we're standing. At about 7.30 a.m. on the morning of July 1st, the first shots of the battle were fired near Marsh Creek uh, by members of the 8th Illinois Cavalry. Willoughby's Run, the closer stream, was the scene of heavy fighting on the morning and the afternoon of July 1st, and it was named for an early resident of Adams County, Willoughby Winchester. From here, we can see the McPherson farm really clearly. And although the house burned in a fire in 1895, the original barn still stands, and it's a very well-known feature on the first day's battlefield. Tenant farmer John Slentz and his family lived here in 1863, and on the morning of July 1st, the family was forced to flee into the town of Gettysburg, and they sought refuge at the home of Harvey Sweeney on Baltimore Street. Now this is the Farnsworth House, of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, and as we'll show you in a later video, this ended up being probably an even more dangerous location for the family. Further down McPherson's Ridge is the farm of John Herbst, and you can see the barn pretty clearly from where we're standing. And although both the barn and the house are replacements for the structures that stood in 1863, the farm has a great story. Herbst and his family didn't leave during the battle. They actually hid in the cellar, and we're going to explore that in a few minutes. Uh, and this decision actually ended up saving the home from destruction at the hands of the Confederates. Of course, to Battle of Gettysburg enthusiasts, Herbst is probably best known for having owned the woods in which Union General John Reynolds was killed around 1030 in the morning on July 1st, 1863. Beyond the Herbst Farm is the former Gettysburg Country Club property, at the time of the battle owned by Washington, D.C. resident Emanuel Harmon. Relatives of his farmed the property during the battle, including 16-year-old Amelia Harmon, who left an incredible account of her experiences during the battle. This farm stood along what is now Old Mill Road, just west of Willoughby's Run. Of course, it's called McPherson's Ridge because the McPherson farm was here along this ridge at the time of the battle. It was owned by Edward McPherson, who grew up in Gettysburg uh, and was a United States congressman until the midterm elections in 1862. Uh, the McPherson family owned the farm for many years. The farm actually uh, was one of the farms of the first settlers of Adams County. Uh, we have a 1765 warrant for the property from a Robert Stort. Uh, by 1773, it was owned by William Breeden, and by that time, undoubtedly, the log house was here on the property. Um, in the uh, 1802, it was uh, owned by the Reverend David McConaughey, who was the grandfather of David McConaughey, the lawyer who lived in town at the time of the battle, was largely responsible for the Gettysburg Battle for Memorial Association after the battle. 
um, in the 1830s. It was uh, owned by a guy named Clarkson, uh, Michael Clarkson, who was an associate with Thaddeus Stevens. And Michael Clarkson was the superintendent of the Gettysburg or Pennsylvania Railroad. It was actually uh, 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 sort of an idea concept in the 1830s. But, you know, it ate up a lot of taxpayers' money. The project was eventually canceled. But we do have an unfinished railroad cut here at the time of the battle because of the 1830s railroad project. And coincidentally, the railroad ran right through the middle of Clarkson's land, who was compensated for the damages to his property during the construction. Uh, Clarkson eventually went bankrupt, and it was purchased by John B. McPherson. And he had died in the 1850s, and at the time of the battle, Edward McPherson owned the property. But the McPhersons never lived here on the farm. It was a tenant uh, farmer that lived here throughout the McPhersons' ownership. And at the time of the battle, we know that the tenant family was John Slants and his wife and children. So there is an image recorded just after the battle uh, by the firm of Matthew Brady with Brady and um, his assistant actually looking across towards the unfinished railroad cut uh, with the McPherson house on the right and the barn there on the left. And in that image, you can kind of see the house is a log structure. After the Civil War at some point, there was a large addition placed onto the house. And it was that reconstructed house that burned to the ground in 1895. And we know the house stood where these trees are today. Uh, there was actually a small pork archaeological dig to discover the location of the house, and they found a few things a number of years ago. Now, we mentioned it was the Slentz family that lived here at the time of the battle. John Slentz, who lived in the town of Gettysburg with his father, John Slentz, married Eliza Herr, who was the daughter of Frederick Herr, who, of course, owned the tavern along Herr's Ridge. And they lived here. We're not sure how long prior to the battle they lived here, and they had a few children. Um, Eliza, her slants, left an account of the battle, and it's from an 1880s Phoenixville newspaper clipping that we get this. Myself, my husband, and our children, five in number, resided on the McPherson farm. I think she had four, and she was pregnant with the fifth, actually. She probably doesn't remember that in the 1880s. Um, on the morning of June 30th, my husband left with the horses with the intention of taking them to a more secure place, but he never succeeded, as the equines were stolen by soldiers. I was engaged in placing bread in the oven when news was brought to us that there was to be a battle that day on July 1st. Instantly, all was confusion, and before a moment had passed, myself and the five children driving our cows before us were fleeing towards the town of Gettysburg. Before we reached the town, our cattle were lost and we took refuge in the cellar of the seminary. We remained in that place for three months, and during the three days fighting, I knew what it was to be hungry for the first time in my life. For during that time, we subsisted on one small piece piece of bread daily. Our home and all the outbuildings were converted into a temporary hospital for the wounded soldiers, over 200 being in the house and barn alone. In the garden adjoining the house, two soldiers are buried, one in a quilt that was owned by me. So we actually know that the Slens family fled to the seminary, and during the heavy fighting around the seminary building on July 1st, they actually went to the other side of town. We know this from the claims file of Harvey Sweeney, that they actually spent the battle in the cellar of Harvey Sweeney's house, which of course today is the Farnsworth house. And afterwards, they came back and they spent about three months in the Schmucker house at the Lutheran Theological Seminary. And we're very fortunate that at the Library Congress in the Edward McPherson papers, there are some letters from John Slants to Edward McPherson specifying some of the damages to the property afterwards. And I actually went to the Library of Congress and made transcripts of some of the letters. On August 10th, 1863, John Slants tells McPherson, 
You stated in your letter that I should tell Mr. Spanger to get Mr. Fleming to remove those dead bodies from around my house. I told him as you requested, but he never attended to it. They are still lying there yet, and they won't let any be raised till the 1st of October. I would give $1,000 if I had it was the way it was back on your place, and I was fixed up the way I was on June 29th. I had a fair prospect before me for a good summer crop, but all is gone. He also talked about the, just the massive amount of rails that needed to be purchased to fix the fence around the property. He mentions in the letter also on that date, I am in Dr. Schmucker's house rent free for two or three months and living, I may almost say, on nothing. We have some bread, butter, and molasses to eat, and we sleep on the floor for want of means. I would like to move back to the place if those dead was away and the water was good. It is very unhealthy along the pike now. And on September 21st, 1863, he wrote, if you intend to make your fence three boards high, it will take 11,900 feet of boards. And if you'd like to make it four boards high, it would take 13,606 boards, and then it will make a good fence. Boards are 16 feet long, and it will take 900 posts. A board fence will make the cheapest fence. I was told today that they want $10 a hundred for rails. The appraisers made out that it would take about 7,000 rails to make up your fence. At $100 a thousand, that would make $700 to replace the fence around the farm that was damaged during the battle. Of course, the McPherson barn still stands. It was purchased by the War Department and they actually reconstructed the barn to similar to its uh, Civil War appearance. And you can look at photographs taken after, before the reconstruction and afterwards and see that they really tore down the whole wall and rebuilt it. But uh, it remains and it's very similar appearance to what it was at the time of the battle. We actually at the Adams County Historical Society have a copy of a letter that was given to us by a descendant of the Slentz family. It is a letter written in 1904 and it is written to Miss Sarah Slentz, who was one of the children of John and Eliza Slentz here at the time. It was written by a, uh, an assistant surgeon, uh, George P. Ryan. Um, and he is hoping that the family still lives at the farm at the time he wrote it. They didn't. So he could come and visit it. And he says, is the barn still there? I want to visit the place again soon as I can and hope to find you there. On the third day of the battle, July 3rd, 1863, I turned the cattle out of the barn to get water. They were bawling so pitifully, I could not bear to hear them. I know that some of them were accidentally killed later on, and no doubt some of them were butchered. The big wounded cow, which I got milk from several times, was in the barn. During the Battle of Gettysburg, Amelia Harmon, who was 16 years old, lived just behind me on the ridge in a large two-story brick home. Also living there at the time were Amelia's aunt, Rachel Finnefrock, and her husband, David, and also a farmhand named William Comfort. David and William had left with the horses to save them from, from Confederate capture before the battle. And in 1915, years later, Amelia Harmon wrote one of the most powerful accounts of the Battle of Gettysburg by a local citizen. She wrote, at 9 a.m. on the morning of July 1st came the ominous boom of a cannon to the west of us. We rushed to the window to behold hundreds of galloping horses coming up the road, through the fields, and even past our very door. Boom, again spoke the cannon, more and more galloping horses, their excited riders shouting and yelling to each other and pushing westward in hot haste past the house and barn. They were seeking the shelter of a strip of woods on the ridge beyond. But the ridge was alive with the enemy, she wrote. A few warning shots from its cover sent them flying back to the shelter behind the barn, outbuildings, trees, and even the pump, seeking to hold the enemy in check. So she was witnessing the opening actions of the Battle of Gettysburg as Buford's cavalrymen were rushing back across these fields toward their position, their fallback position on McPherson's Ridge on the other side of Willoughby's Run. 
And then later in the day, as the, the fighting continued, there was a lull um, about midday. And uh, there were some Union soldiers who actually were ordered to capture the Harmon House and Barn to use it as an outpost to fire on the Confederates west of them uh, in the woods at the base of Hers Ridge to, to my left. So Amelia Harmon remembered these Union soldiers coming across the creek and up the hill. They were members of the 80th New York um, or the 20th New York State Militia. They had been positioned on McPherson's Ridge and sent across uh, to take the house. So Amelia and her aunt remembered, uh, this is from Amelia's account, a sudden violent commotion and uproar below made us fly in quick haste to the lower floor. There was a tumultuous pounding with fists and guns on the kitchen door and loud yells of open or we'll break down the doors, which they proceeded to do. We drew the bolt and import a stream of maddened, powder-blackened bluecoats who ordered us to the cellar while they dispersed to the various west windows throughout the house. So at this point, there's more sharpshooting. The Confederates are preparing for an afternoon assault to take the Union positions on the east side of Willoughby's Run. Um, and so Amelia Harmon, as they waited, uh, not knowing what, what's about to happen, eventually the Confederate attack begins and the Union soldiers are forced to leave the house very quickly to get back to safety across Willoughby's Run. And she wrote, with a sickening dread, we waited for the next act in the drama. A swish like the mowing of grass on the front lawn, then a dense shadow darkened the low graded cellar windows. It is the sound and the shadow of hundreds of marching feet. We can see them to the knees only, but the uniforms are the Confederate gray. Now we understand the scurrying feet overhead. Our soldiers have been driven back, have retreated, left the house, and left us to our fate. We rushed up the cellar steps to the kitchen. The barn was in flames and cast a lurid glare through the window. The house was filled with rebels and they were deliberately firing it. They had taken down a file of newspapers for kindling, piled on books, rugs, and furniture, applied matches to ignite the pile, and already a tiny flame was curling upward. Amelia wrote that they both jumped on the fire in the hopes of extinguishing it and pled with them in pity to spare our home. But there was no pity in those determined faces, she wrote. They proceeded to carry out their full purpose and told us to get out or we would burn with it. They were the Louisiana Tigers, they boasted, and, and Tigers indeed they were. Now, of course, there were no Louisiana soldiers anywhere near here uh, on the afternoon of July 1st. They were actually members of the 52nd North Carolina that had been ordered to burn the building to avoid having it used by the Union forces later if the tides were turning back um, so that if they had to withdraw, there wouldn't be more Union soldiers coming back and, and using the house to harass them um, with, with their sharpshooting. So at this point, Amelia Harmon and her aunt have to decide, are they going to stay in the house and, and, and try to fight with the Confederates to, to put the fire out, or will they run out into the middle of the battle and seek shelter elsewhere? And they decided to, to run. Uh, she wrote, we fled from our burning home only to encounter worse horrors. The first rebel line of battle had passed the house and were now engaged in a hot skirmish in the gorge of Willoughby's Run. The second line was just abreast the barn, and at that moment were being hotly attacked by Union troops with shot and shell. We were between the lines. To go toward town would be to walk into the jaws of death. Only one way was open, through the ranks of the whole Confederate army, to safety in its rear. Bullets whistled past our ears, shells burst and scattered their deadly contents all about us. On we hurried, wounded men falling all around us, the line moving forward as they fired it seemed with deadly precision, past what seemed miles of artillery with horses galloping like mad toward the town. She wrote, we were objects of wonder and amazement, that was certain, but few took time to listen to our story and none believed it. All kept hurrying us to the rear. Go on, go on, they shouted, out of reach of grape and canister. They returned a few days after the battle to find what Amelia described as a, a powder blackened ruin at the site of their once prosperous two-story brick farm. Actually, in a, a strange coincidence, the farm had actually been built by the Reverend Charles G. McLean and his wife. His wife was Helen Miller, who was the aunt of Eleanor Junkin, who some of you may know was the first wife of Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. So there's an interesting connection there. And in, in fact, the, the very soldiers that had accidentally mortally wounded Stonewall Jackson at the Battle of Chancellorsville were actually not far from this site and passed by the burning house that had been constructed by his wife's aunt and uncle. Amelia Harmon died in New Jersey in 1923, and she's one of only a few area citizens whose home was actually intentionally burned during the battle. After the Civil War, the Harmon property was converted into a resort after the discovery of a, a supposed medicinal spring in 1865. And in 1869, a hotel was constructed, the Gettysburg Springs Hotel, that welcomed throngs of visitors and operated until the early 1900s. Eventually, that hotel burned down in 1917 in an accidental fire. Then the property became what was for many years called the Gettysburg Country Club, a favorite golf course for President Eisenhower. 
And then more recently in 2011, the property found its way back uh, to becoming part of the Gettysburg National Military Park where you can visit it today. So Amelia Harmon's story is a wonderful testament to some of the experiences of, of young children and, and teenagers. She's only 16 years old and has her house burned, her house destroyed, her entire, uh, the entire contents of the house were destroyed. Um, and uh, so many years later, recounted in, in incredible detail what had happened to her. Uh, it really speaks to the trauma that these citizens endured in July of 1863. So here we are, not far from McPherson's Ridge, at the John Herbst farm on the first day's battlefield. John Herbst was about 40 years old at the time of the battle, and John Herbst owned about 160 acres. In his property included the area from the Fairfield Road or the Hagerstown Pike all the way up to the edge of the McPherson farm, and it included a woodlot that after the battle was widely called McPherson's Woods, although it was owned by John Herbst at the time. And of course, it was in the edge of that woodlot where General John Fulton Reynolds was killed on July 1st. The Herbst family remained in their cellar during the fighting. After the war, John Herbst filed a claim with the federal government for damages to his property during the battle. And according to a deposition, a portion of the 1st Army Corps of the Potomac occupied his farm and around his house and barn during the fighting. He and his family took shelter in the cellar, there being a great deal of firing about the buildings. Our troops were compelled to fall back and the rebels took possession of the place. He came out of the cellar and was met by a rebel soldier or officer of low grade who told him he was ordered to burn the buildings on account of the Yankees having been firing from them. He set fire to the barn and insisted on burning the house also, but found that there were wounded men, one of whom was a Union soldier and two rebels who had been carried into the house and who begged him not to burn it, one of them being too badly wounded to be removed. So he did not burn the house. The barn was burned to the ground. Today, the barn is rebuilt on the original foundation. And according to a date stone, it was built about 1872. The original house no longer stands and is replaced by a more modern house. Sadly, for John Herbst and his children, his wife Susan would die on September 2nd 1863 as a direct result of the contamination from the wounded and the dead on the battlefield after the fighting was over.